right, here we go. Russell Peters, welcome to Vlad TV. DJ Vlad. <laughs> Vlad, Vlad, Vlad. You actually know me from my DJ days. I do know you from your DJ days. That's yeah. exactly how I met you. Yeah, the first uh, well, time. Well, I was from yeah. that from the uh, Rap Phenomenon mixtape that you released with, with Dirty Harry. And I was like, yo, this shit is fire. I remember burning the hell out of that for many, many people. Yeah, uh, I think if it wasn't for that mixtape, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Yeah, because that was the best one. That was the definitive mixtape to prove that Biggie was the best. Yeah, yeah. Because you put him over any beat and he rocked like it was his beat. Yeah, yeah, he was amazing. Yeah, uh, his cadence and yeah. his his wordplay, his wordplay. I his don't think flow the yeah. way he flowed on things. Yeah. yeah, the subject matter was pretty much the same throughout. Well, that's fine. Yeah, I but mean that, that's have, always a criticism, right? I mean, he didn't have it on a long career. Two hours. He didn't, have, he didn't have long enough to to show you his. And he was young. He was in his early 20s. You know what I mean? Yeah. How do you have how, how much do you thinking do you think expect a kid to do? You'd put him over Tupac. Oh, for sure. Any day for me. Really? For me, any day. I, I like Tupac as an actor and as an iconic human being. But as a rapper MC, I'm a real hip hop kind of head. So I'm always listening for like flow and like 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 a hip hop MC kind of guy. He was a rapper, a very successful, talented human being. But as far as for me, I mean, that's that's why it's art, because it's a matter of opinion. Yeah. I mean, that debate's going to keep going. Long it's past, always going to go. Past our lifetime. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and uh, but I always boil it down on hip hop levels. So, yeah, I mean, I can see an argument for it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And people that love him, love him. Like, and I, I have friends that. Love him. I have friends that were good friends with him. I have friends that know him, you know what I mean? Or knew him. And I have friends that still have letters he wrote them from jail, you know? Wow. So, you know, they're always like, yo, Russ, man, you gotta. And I'm like, it's not, it wasn't my thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is your first time here. Yeah. Let's go ahead and start from the from the very beginning. First time so caller. You grew up <laughs> in Toronto. Correct. Born and raised. Yep. And your parents are Indian. Correct, from India. From India. So they were first, they were immigrants. They were immigrants. And then okay. I was first generation. Uh -huh. My brother was born in India too, but he ah. he came to Canada when he was 10 months old. So it wasn't really his choice. <laughs> okay. So you grew up and you actually were raised Catholic. Yeah. Okay. Is that is that popular with Indian people or not I mean, so much? It, it, the type of Indian my family is, is uh, uh, we're Anglo Indians and that's a whole another long history lesson right there but um if you really want to break it down to its final thing it's it an anglo-indian is defined by the father being british and the mother being indian and then the offspring is anglo-indian and if the father is indian and the mother is british it's considered a eurasian oh okay yeah and uh uh my family uh, are anglo-indians through lineage so it was are like we I, my cousin went and did my dad's side of the family tried to figure out when we became anglo indians and it turns out it was like 1830 something ah okay some british soldier impregnated this woman um and then he fucked off and bounced back to england kind of like and bob he got Mar knighted the, the bob marley story kind of kind of yeah yeah <laughs> ba yeah basically yeah, yeah the scottish guy um yeah so it was the same thing and then um that woman had a baby and then she went to the nuns and the nuns helped raise them. And then I think that's around the time that the Anglo-Indians were starting. And then there was a colony of Anglo-Indians. And they would, then the Anglo-Indians grew up and their first language was always English. And they got like the government type jobs. They never got, uh, and they were, you know, his, if you look back, they're usually entertainers or writers or chefs or musicians and stuff like that. They're, you know, we weren't known for being professionals. Gotcha. Okay, so you're growing up as an Indian kid in Toronto, mm -hmm. and uh, hip hop is starting to come around. Well, yeah, I mean, around junior high, high school or so. Yeah, yeah, around junior high. Yeah, um, yeah, seventh grade. Yep. Uh, yeah, around there, I was when I started. Like, oh shit, I don't know what's going on here, but I dig it. Yep. Yeah, and it started too. from break dancing for me. It was me too. That's actually how I started yeah. with hip hop. I started as a break dancer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you uh, wanted to be boy, and you were like, this, you're trying to get as good as you can get. And oh, you yeah. realize, and you'd get mad as shit when you see somebody better than you. That was like your, like from your crew, and you're like, how the fuck did they get so good? And I'm still shit. I still can't do the windmill to this day. I, I you know, I 
got the windmill by the time b-boying was not popular to do anymore and i was like oh. god damn it i just got it <laughs> it took me three years to figure out how to do a windmill it's a hard move it is a hard move it's probably the hardest breakdance move i think so and i yeah. try and I, I i think in my late 30s when i would get drunk i would try and do it and i would do like one around and i would know i did it because the next morning my kidneys would be hurting and my knees would be bruised <laughs> and i'm like i think i did it and somebody went no no you didn't <laughs> I saw Jadakus actually has a mean windmill. Really? There was a video that circulated like a few years ago of him doing the windmill, like at his age. And everyone's like, oh, shit. That's dope. Yeah. Yeah, that's dope. Yep. Okay. So you're growing up in Toronto. And did you know that you were going to do comedy? Like as a kid, high school, nothing? I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. Mm -hmm. I, re I really had no direction in my life. I knew I wasn't going to go to college because number one, we couldn't afford it. Number two. It was just not in the books for me. I I, did, I wasn't a good student. I hated school. Okay. And uh, and I didn't. I've always. I, I've never liked authority, and I've always questioned authority, and I've never really taken to orders very well. Okay, but you're growing up with these Indian parents. Yeah, but they're Anglo Indian parents, so it's a little different. Ah, it's not the traditional. It's not the traditional. You got to become a doctor. No Indian parents. No, my mom worked in Kmart in the cafeteria. Okay. And my dad worked in a chicken plant. Like, like a meat packing plant. So we were like, we were crazy blue collar. Like a good day, like in the 80s for us would be, we didn't have a microwave. But my mom would sometimes bring the microwave home from the Kmart kitchen. Like <laughs> she'd be doing the late shift, like that. And she'd be doing the eight o'clock closing shift. And she'd bring the microwave home for the night. Or and then, then bring it back the next yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's not and stealing. It, and it was the one with the dial. <laughs> And we were like, yo, this is amazing. We're going to have hot food tonight. Hot pockets. This is not even, man. It was... Remember, that was the that was pre-microwave food. Yeah. That was just like heating shit up. That's all it was there for. Okay. And uh, based on your comedy routines, uh, I guess your dad beat you a lot. <laughs> not a lot. He beat me a couple of times. A couple of times. I don't think it takes a lot of beatings uh, um, in your life for you to understand that your dad will whoop your ass. Yeah. It takes about... Two good beatings and a couple of claps on the head every now and then. All right. And you had a famous phrase? Somebody's going to get hurt real bad. <laughs> yep. That was it. But that's not my, my dad actually never said that. Oh, so you made that up. I made that up. <laughs> I didn't make it up. What happened was um, I used to DJ these. Um, I would take a DJ gig anywhere you asked me to play. I didn't give a shit. Like, what is it? How much money? Hundred. I'm in. 100 bucks? I'm in. Um, and I would DJ these Indian dances. They would... So what happened is in the 90s, like the Indian parents were very strict. So the kids would have a day party where the parents thought the kids were going to school. But really, they were just going to this nightclub that they had, some promoters had rented out for the day. And the party would start at like noon and end at four. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so the kids would come and they would get drunk and shit in the day. And uh, I would DJ these parties, but they would hire me to play the, uh, as they called it, the Western music. <laughs> Because then I didn't play Indian music. I was like, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not playing that. And so I would play like the hip hop or the R&B or the dance or whatever. And there would always be fights at these parties. Always fights because I don't know why. And uh, I used to box. So whenever I see a fight, I always run to it. Uh, it's a nature. Like, it's like, ooh, I want to. It's not like I want to jump in the fight. I just want to see what they're doing. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> so I, I, these fights would always break out. So any one time a fight broke out and uh I ran to the fight and my friends all ran with me and we see these guys about to throw down and this really fobby kind of Indian dude gets in the middle and he goes, hey, no fighting today, okay? Or somebody going to get hurt real bad. And then me and my friends like fell out dying laughing. <laughs> and then for years we would say it to each other just in like, we'd be like, all right, I'll talk to you later. Hey, hey somebody going to get hurt real bad. And we'd hang up and that was it. And then it just stuck in my head. It sat dormant in my head for about, Eight or nine years before I brought it onto the stage. Okay. So you started performing in 1989, age 19. Correct. What made you get on that stage for the first time? Was it like an open mic kind of thing? Yeah, it was an amateur night. I um, I didn't really have any direction in my life. Hmm. And uh, like I literally had no direction. My, my cousin told me, my cousin um, Andrew said to me that, you know, he goes, you know, you're really funny. You should go do stand-up comedy. But he didn't say it the same sarcastic way other people had said it to me before. <laughs> he was like, yo, you're really funny. You should go do stand-up. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. 
And then my brother goes, wait, what do you want to do with your life, dude? Because I was I was 18. And he's like, yo, you need to do something. You need to get a direction. I go, I don't know, maybe comedy. I, I said it like maybe, you know. And he goes, you want to do comedy? Have you ever seen live comedy? I go, I, I mean, I saw Eddie Murphy on Maple Leaf Gardens in 1986. Because mm. no, no, no. And I, and I said, I've seen George Carlin live. And he's like, well, listen, do you want to go see how they really do it? You can't go look at the top guys. You got to go see how they really do it. I said, all right. So my brother took me around to a bunch of different open mic type places. He took me to like a theater sports. Theater sports, which is like a um, uh, an improv kind of thing. Hmm. And then he took me to go see Amateur Night. And I go, because the theater sports, I was like, that's not it. And then we went to see Amateur Night. I was like, that's it. That's it. That's what I want to do. So I said, all right. So I signed up. I must have signed up two months later. And I, I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go do it. And I went and did it. And I sucked. <laughs> I fucking suck. You got booed? No, I didn't get booed. I got a giggle. <laughs> I got a giggle and I was like, ooh, a giggle. I'll take that. I'll take the giggle. And then I came back again and I got more giggles. You know, you get five minutes. I think I did four the first night and three the second. You and it was getting shorter and shorter. You couldn't get through the whole five. I couldn't get through the whole five. I was like, I'm scared. Okay. And then eventually I, you know, just I just kept doing it. Out of sheer blind um stupidity okay then in 1992 you met uh george carlin on the street in toronto that was the night the blue jays won the world series mm. and uh everybody was partying up and down young street in toronto and uh i was a 22 year old smart ass kid and i'm walking down the street with my friends and we see this old guy with a ponytail walking towards us and i go hey, this guy looks like george carlin i thought he was like a homeless guy <laughs> <laughs> for real i was like yo this guy looks like fucking george carlin he walked past me and go how you doing george i'm just being a dick i go how you doing george he goes how you doing kid i went what the fuck and i ran after him and i walked him back to his hotel just babbling the entire time okay. telling him i'm a comedian and i and i blah blah any blah, tips and anything and he and he told me just get on stage as much as you can and if you're if you're at a bar and they have a band and the band takes a break go ask the band if you can do five minutes hmm. Uh, if you, even if you bomb, he goes, if you bomb, it's fine. If you kill, it's fine. It doesn't matter. The more you get on stage, the better you get at it. And I said, okay, thank you. I go, hey, maybe one day we'll work together, huh? He goes, you never know, kid. It's crazy business. <laughs> and then you cut to 2000 and uh, uh, when did he pass? 2008? Uh, I think he passed in 2008. He did. Yeah, he passed in 2008. So 2007, uh, in July of 2007, he was uh, doing these warm-up sets at the Hermosa Beach Comedy Club, Comedy Magic Club. And they knew I was a huge Carlin fan. And they're like, listen, Carlin's coming in and he's working on his new act. He just had a quadruple bypass and he wants to work on his new act. I was like, oh my God, can I come watch? He goes, do you want to be on the show? And I go, fuck yeah. Okay. I said, let me host. They go, we already got a host. I go, damn, I'd really like to host. They go, okay, fine, you're going to host. They moved that guy <laughs> to the middle and I went to the host. Okay. And uh, so I got to introduce him and I got all my chin started quivering when I was introducing him. My voice started to <laughs> this. I got so emotional doing it. And then he was like, he shook my hand and goes, stop it, kid. You're making me look bad. <laughs> and he was really nice. He was a really, really sweet guy. I mean, if you were to name your top four Mount Rushmore comedians, who would they be? For me? Yeah, for you. Uh, Carlin, Murphy, Rickles. Rickles? Yeah. You don't hear that a lot. Yeah, I know. Don Rickles. And uh, got to be careful with number four. Yep. And people get mad when I don't add Patrice O'Neill. Aha. Uh -huh. And people get mad that I didn't add Pryor. And I love Pryor and I respect Pryor and I appreciate everything he did. But um, the others spoke to me more. Yeah. I mean, you hear Patrice O'Neill a lot. Uh, a lot of people, like actual comedians oh, yeah. that I interview will name Patrice O'Neill. Oh, well, I used to sleep on Patrice's couch. Hmm. Back in uh, 96, when him and uh, Keith Robinson were roommates in Woodbridge, New Jersey. And uh, they would sit on like a leather couch like that. And and they would sit there playing fucking video games till like 630 in the morning. Nintendo. And I would and I would wait on the armchair and fall asleep till they got up. And then I would put my head where their asses weren't. And then I'd go to sleep <laughs> on the couch. <laughs> Man, rest in peace, George Carlin. That was such a he was so different. Like the way he approached his comedy was so intelligent. Yeah, he, would he was kind a of, wordsmith. He was a wordsmith, exactly. He wasn't. He didn't really do jokes. He didn't do impressions. Really, he just would word his way into these incredible stories. Yeah, and I mean, he did do. Um, yeah, he like he would 
he would do jokes in the way that you could quote something out of a joke. Yeah. Out of one of his stories, you could quote something, you know? Yeah, he would, he would like do an entire bit, but you could quote bits of the bit. Yeah. And he would always do things about, and it was always language based, like word based. And my dad was an English major. So my dad and I would enjoy him together because my dad loved the wordplay. Mm -hmm. And he'd do things about um, halfway dirty words and words that are clean when they're not together. And then there's words that are, when you put them together, they're dirty. Like cock is in the Bible. Sucker, you go to the doctor, you get a sucker, but you put them together, you got cock sucker. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just shit like that. And me go, fuck, I wish I thought of that. You know what I mean? Well, he really broke down religion really well. Yeah. Because yeah, he was essentially an atheist. I am as well. So I really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and he really, you know, I remember this one routine about the, you know, whenever you go to a funeral, at some point, someone's going to say, I know he's up there looking down at us and smiling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, there is no up there. Yeah. <laughs> he's right. he's probably down there <laughs> looking up at us. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so you know, he, religion has us con convinced that there's an invisible man and is living in the sky. Exactly. And he's watching everything you do, but he's particularly keen on what you do with your penis. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you, you uh, were raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic. So at one point, did you just say? I, nah. I Listen, even as a kid, I would question everything. Yeah. I would my, would go to church and I'd be like, it doesn't add up to me in here. Just something seems off. And and I had questions and you weren't allowed to ask questions. And I'm like, well, that seems a little odd. If you're trying to sell me something and I'm not allowed to ask questions about it, then how I don't something's not right with me. But something doesn't work for me on this. Yeah. I feel you. I'm an atheist myself. Yeah. I mean, you I was were probably raised, a Jew at some point. I was raised Jewish, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was raised Jewish. But at one point, I mean, I haven't gone to a synagogue in decades at this yeah, point. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where I don't want to be defined by that. I think. Yeah. And people, you know, and, you know, it's 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 rough for me because, you know, I, most of my friends, about 99 percent of my friends are black and a lot of them are very, you know, not not very, but they're all very, you know, the black community is very, it's very uh, prevalent, the, the, the religion thing. Yeah. And, uh, but my, my whole goal is just, listen, at the end of the day, did I do good things and nice things for people when I was here? That's all I care about. Yeah. I don't need a book to tell me to be nice. I, I should already have been nice. Well, you said in your act that Jews actually get a bad rap uh, for being cheap because Indians are way cheaper. Yeah, we could out Jew. We could out Jew a Jew. Any you could out Jew a Jew. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? Because we're, it's in our blood. I think you guys do it for for sport. We do it out of instinct. <laughs> like you did this one joke about how how Jews, Chinese, and Indians approach a Louis Vuitton store. Yes, I, I can't remember it now, but I remember the joke. It's like tw twelve years old. That joke. right. Well, I guess like uh. A Jewish guy, if he's passing a Louis Vuitton store, can I get and a discount? There's a sale. Yeah, yeah. He'll go in there and buy everything. Yeah. An Indian guy will not. Yeah, and a Chinese person go in and take pictures and <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> knock it off. Yeah. And I guess that no, uh, the Chinese guy. So the Jewish guy would go in if there was a sale, he would go and buy it all. Yeah. Then the Chinese guy would go and take pictures and knock it off, and then the Indian guy would buy the knockoff of the Chinese guy. <laughs> right, and I guess that uh, the Chinese uh, and Indians just cannot do business together at all. Yeah, these are you're going way back on these. Yep, I yeah. am. I am. Yeah. yeah, these are. Yeah, those were those were the fun times. <laughs> why, why can't Chinese and Indians do business together? We're two. Uh, listen, we're two. You got two shady motherfuckers trying to do business <laughs> together. That's why. <laughs> well, in 1993, you were performing. Uh, you were opening up for the Far Side. Yes, June of 1993. And what happened? I got booed off stage for the very first time. Okay, off stage. Um, literally, I was like, oh. I, it was my fault. Like, I think about it all the time, and I'm like, I did every single thing wrong that night. I had, like, a baseball jersey made for me because, you know, it was the time of the baseball jerseys. Mary J. Blige was one of the two black guys won in the, in the Real Love video, and everybody's rocking the baseball jersey. So I had a friend who was making shirts, and they made me a baseball jersey, and it said Strictly Hip Hop on it. And, <laughs> and I wore, it was, like, cream-colored with red writing. And then I wore red jeans with it, and uh, I tucked it in. <laughs> I fucking tucked it in. <laughs> you idiot, Russell. Okay. I tucked it in. That was my first problem. 
And then uh, I just got booed off. And I deserved it. For sure. Were people like throwing stuff at you? No, they were just throwing verbal jabs at me. And I was like, get the hell off the stage. You fucking suck. You suck. Yeah, <laughs> fuck you. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, but wait, I got any jokes. I got more <laughs> jokes. <laughs> like I would have been in the crowd with you. I mean, uh, you fucking loser. Okay. That was but the first time. That's good. It's your chin check moment in comedy. Okay. The first time you get booed off and how you handle it and how you felt when it happened. You can tell if somebody's really. Um, uh, intimately involved with how they feel on stage by how they react to adverse times. So at that point, by uh, what year did I say that was? That 93. Was 93. That's three years into your career. Four. Four years into your career. Were you doing it full time at that point? Um, I mean, sort of. Yeah, I guess I was. I would do like... A, work here and there but i would uh, you know i was between that and djing okay so i'd dj whatever if i didn't have work i would dj a party or a club or a fucking wedding or an anniversary i didn't give a shit that's when you had to rent speakers too mm -hmm. <laughs> i remember i used to dj yeah okay so at what point did the comedy start to support you i would say around late 94 okay it started to really pick up and then by 95 i was doing it full time and what really changed in 94 95 um, I got an article in the Toronto Star. Hmm. The This writer came down. I remember his name, Henry Mankiewicz. Uh, good Jewish uh, Japanese guy. I, uh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, Henry Mankiewicz came down to see Kenny Robinson, who was headlining that, that night, and I was just featuring. <clears throat> and uh, he saw me, and then he decided to write the article on me instead. And uh, that that's kind of what launched... Um, the eyes on me at that point. Okay, and then you started getting more paid gigs? Yeah, then I got invited to the Toronto Comedy Festival, the People's Comedy Festival. And uh, I remember that the article came out the day I was on the People's Comedy Festival, but it just so happened to be my birthday that day. So I remember it very clearly. And, uh, and then from that article, I got offered a movie um, from this uh, guy named Nicholas Campbell, who was an actor from Toronto. Very good actor, very successful actor too. He was... Uh, he played, uh, I think he played JFK in a movie, even once. Okay, Booze Can, that was the movie. Yeah, Booze Can was the movie. Yeah, I played Snake's friend. Okay, <laughs> Snake's friend, right. I'm looking at the, the Wikipedia page. It doesn't yeah. actually have a Wikipedia entry. Yeah. It must have not been a, a huge blockbuster. No, it was, it, was a, it, was a very, uh, it was a very underground movie. It was about underground booze cans in Toronto. <laughs> and uh, I think the movie ran out of money, and a lot of people didn't get paid, and I know I did, but it was, I was getting such minimal amounts, it didn't matter if I got paid or not. Okay. So then by this time, by, you know, you're starting to get actual paid gigs and you're supporting yourself mm -hmm. as a full-time comedian. Right. W what happens next? What's the next kind of milestone after that? Then in 95, I did my first comedy special. Okay. Um, and it was a, the CBC in Canada used to do this series called Comics. And it was 22 minutes half an hour special so you do 22 minutes and uh but you would do s skits in between as bumpers for the commercial breaks mm -hmm. so basically you're doing about 12 maybe around 15 minutes of stand-up and then the rest is like sketches and that was really well received and then i got nominated for a gemini award which is a canadian emmy mm. and uh i lost but i remember this one uh this one comedy writer at the end of 95, um, did his year in review um, for this, um, I think it was, whatever the fucking magazine was called, some Toronto magazine, and this guy Andrew Clark, I think his name was. And he said, comics, the little show that could, uh, trudged on with some real miles, with, with, some, uh, with some real highs, Mark Farrell, and some real lows, Russell Peters. <laughs> and I was like, you fucking asshole. I'm like, really, motherfucker? And, well, did any of those guys get nominated from that? No, I did, you cunt. So I was really pissed. I think I'm still holding a resentment towards the guy. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. In 2004, you had a, a TV show. Well, you had a special on Comedy Now. Yeah, Comedy Now. That was my third special. Your third special at this Yeah, so point. the second one was in 97, and then the third was in 2003. Okay. So I had, you know, and we shot it in 2003. It aired in 2004. And... Uh, I uh, 
I had six years to get my act together. Mm -hmm. So you got to figure, I got my first special in six years, and then I got my second special two years after that. And I didn't, I wasn't really into my zone or anything yet. You know what I mean? I was still trying to figure my way around this thing. And they offered me a lot of money with the time, 10 grand. It was a lot of money back then. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, for sure. And then it was six years before I got offered something else again. Okay. And then I had six years to prepare that material. So that shit was polished, ready, and good to go, you know. Right. And in that act, there was the skit about the, the three gay Indian guys. Oh, yeah, that, that really happened. I was watching the news with my dad. These, uh, it was the gay pride weekend, and then we're watching the news, and these gay Indian guys goes, we are Indian and we are gay. And my dad goes, do you know them? And I'm like, what? Well, <laughs> you are in the entertainment business, and they are of the gay. <laughs> of the gay. <laughs> <laughs> my dad never spoke like that, but it was way funnier when I did it that way. My dad did say, do you know them? But I added the other part. Oh, he did say, well, they're gay and you're in the entertainment business. But I said it'd be funny if my dad was like, and you are of the gay. Because okay. I had heard my friend's father say, oh, my God, he is of the gay. <laughs> <laughs> well, because at the time, there were no prominent Indian comedians. There was, I was the first guy. Like, before you think about all, the, all of them now. Yeah, that's... I started when, before some of them were born. Right, because uh, I started some before some of them were born. I started when some of them were three, two, three years old. Yeah, you know? uh, Aziz Ansari used to open up for you, right? No, no, no. Okay, I Hassan Minaj did. Oh, okay, sorry, I mixed yeah, you're getting up. your uh, you're getting your Muslim Indians mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> Hassan's opened for me a few times. Yeah. Okay. And all these guys are doing great. They're probably doing better than I. Am. <laughs> well, I mean, in this act, you really went very heavy with like the Indian accents and making fun of the the Indian culture and stuff like that. I, I, I was just doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even trying to do anything that I wasn't normally doing. So, But I was just doing a lot of different cultural bits. I was doing the Italians, the Jamaicans, the Chinese, the Indians. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just, it's just what I was doing at the time, you know. Well, how was that received in the Indian community? Because now I, you have this guy that's doing, I mean, why were there no other Indian comedians before you? It's not um, like you, it wasn't. Listen, you're they, not the first funny Indian guy. But. Yeah, I know, but I think it was. Listen, I, when you're going into the unknown, there's always got to be somebody first, and then everybody goes, well, "Why didn't everybody else do that?" You go, "Well, no, it need you need one person to open that door for other people to get in." Okay, so when you started doing it, how did the Indian community in America react to it? Uh, when they saw that special, yeah, that I was I was a, a hero all of a sudden. Okay. Yeah, everyone was like, oh my God, this is something we can do. Why do you think there's been an influx since then? It, it inspired a lot of kids to, to really, wow, I think we can try something else. We don't need to be these professional doctors, lawyers. But it's funny because a lot of them still went to university and studied mm -hmm. all that just in case. And I had no just in case. Yeah. I was, it, was either, it was do or die for me. Yeah, I remember uh, Kobe Bryant had this fa uh, famous quote where... Uh, you know, he told him on Shumpert, he went to Mon Shumpert's high school and he said, put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. If it doesn't work out, make more eggs. Yeah. I remember when I, when I first, um, you know, when I was early into my career, my dad, my dad said to me, son, this is not the business for us. I go, what do you mean? He goes, this is not what our people do. Mm -hmm. This is, look, you got, it's for the Jews, the blacks, the whites, that's their world. It's the, and I go, he goes, we're, we're not in that world. I go, dad. That's why I should be doing it. Yeah. There's a fucking empty space there that needs to be filled. And that's what happened when my special came out in 2004. It started speaking to the unspoken to. Right. And it wasn't just like the Indian community that joined it. It was all the immigrant community. So it was the Indians, the Chinese, the Italians, the Jamaicans, the, and anybody else who kind of felt like uh, they were this invisible minority at that time. Well, that video got uploaded to YouTube and just started to go crazy. Yeah, it was started, so in 2004, it started to get file shared. Mm -hmm. And I still don't even know how that happened because it had only aired in Canada at that point. Yeah. It aired on Valentine's Day in 2004. And, um, and I guess somebody videotaped it. And, uh, and then, I don't, know how, I don't know how technically savvy everybody became all of a sudden and then. But it started getting chopped up into bits. It was, so it was like the Italian bit would get sent to all the Italian people. And then the Chinese bit was getting sent to the Chinese community. And the Jamaican bit was getting sent there. And the Indian, like everything was just getting sent around. And then people were like, I want to see more of this guy. And then eventually, a year later, YouTube started. 
Right. Then it got uploaded to YouTube. It got uploaded to YouTube. I don't know how many views it's at. What's it at? Uh, a I lot. I think it's at a billion or something. Yeah, I think a trillion. Is it? Yeah, a trillion, trillion views, yeah. yeah. Uh, it really was. It was like a few years ago. It was at like three hundred million. I believe it. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, there was other copies. That's what I'm saying. The one I saw. Yeah. Yeah. There was like other copies of it. Yeah. You got to see. Like, around. you got to find the one with the highest number. I would imagine that would be the first one. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Unless it's, you know, that's maybe the weakest quality. I don't know. Whatever. Who but knows? I still, to this day, don't know who uploaded it. Yeah. Well, that kind of took you to a whole different place. It took me completely out of. It, it took me out of the stratosphere. It took me into places I never ever thought. I would be. Right, because by 2007, you sold out Toronto's Air Canada Center. Two nights in a row. Two nights in a row, 16,000 tickets in two a night, days. Yeah. A night. Yeah. And then so I that's saw. So that's it's like a stadium, basically? Yeah, it's where the Raptors play. Okay. Yeah. How did it Raptors feel? Raptors play, the Leafs play. How did it feel to be this Indian kid growing up in Toronto to suddenly being in your hometown and performing to the Raptors? <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. Stadium, is, I remember like, going there for concerts and stuff. Yeah. And I remember, and even if I went for like a sporting event, I'm not a sports guy. So I would sit there and I would just look around the arena all the time, just like, could you imagine? It never even occurred to me that it was a possibility. Yeah. I'd be like, could you imagine performing? How would you perform in front of all these people? That doesn't make sense. It didn't, didn't add up to my head. I was like, that'd be amazing. I think you're going to do music to that. That's the only thing that can work like that. Or sports. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And then, you know, you cut to, wow, I'm, I'm out there. And then, the first night when, when you're backstage and the night lights go down and you hear 16,000 people roar, um, for you, you realize, holy shit, that's just for me. They're literally, like, I'm about to walk out and I, and I got teary-eyed and my chin started quivering and I walked on stage and they gave me a standing ovation. I almost fucking cried again. I'm like, Jesus Christ, keep it together, kid. Okay. And I think I even said, stop it, you're going to make me cry. And, uh, and then I did my set and it was great and I was very happy and... Then we sold it out again two years later for two nights, and mm. and uh, you know, and then it was it was happening all over Canada. I did the GM uh, Rogers Arena or GM Place, whatever it was called, in uh, in Vancouver for two nights, and that was eighteen thousand a night. Were those your biggest paydays yet at that point? Oh, for sure. That those were incredible years. Okay, so suddenly you went from well, here's how it a was. working comedian to someone who's doing you know, no, massive it went, arenas. It went like this. I did the special in 2003. They paid me $7,500. Yeah. I was so broken in debt. I just signed the back of the check and I was just $7,500 less in debt. <laughs> and then I was supposed to go shoot a movie in New York in, in September, October. Mm -hmm. And literally the day I was about to leave Toronto to drive to uh, New York, the director called because funding got, we, the, our financer pulled out. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And I had, Booked no work for those two months. And I was like, I'm fucked. Because hmm. it wasn't like I had any money at the time. And my brother, him and I lived together at the time. And I thank God he was working. And he was like, go on, I got, I got it. I got, I'll cover the mortgage for us for these few months. Hmm. And then I just picked up a random gig in South Africa in October. I had to take a huge pay cut. I mean, I remember flying to South Africa in economy, in the middle seat, in the middle of a middle seat. Hmm. You know, the middle aisle in the middle seat. I'm like, God damn it, this sucks. And I remember just like, you know, but I had only known that life. Mm -hmm. But I still remember going, this fucking sucks. And I knew I had a following in South Africa and the promoter knew that, but he still underpaid me because he kind of knew I was stuck. <laughs> he was a scumbag. Okay. And, uh, and then, you know, I was just struggling to make money. And then even the night before the special aired in Canada on February 13, 2004, I did uh, I did DePaul University where they paid me seven hundred bucks, hmm. and I was like, "Yo, that's a lot of money," and uh, and like twelve or thirteen people came to the show. <laughs> so they lost. Nobody knew who I was. But then you cut to October, or November of two thousand four, and I sold out like three or four nights at some in banquet halls and then some theaters, and I made like thirty five thousand dollars in these. I'm like, "What the fuck is going on?" Well, how much did you make when you did the the Air Canada Center? Oh, it depends, you know. But I would say upwards of half a million a night, I think, or something like that. So you went from seventy five hundred dollars that went straight to your debt, yeah, to making a million bucks. Yeah, it's pretty in two crazy. nights. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. What happened when you got that type of type of money? I, I I didn't. In my head, I was just like, I can't believe this shit. And I, but the thing is, I'd already. My goal was to make a million dollars, like when I started picking up steam. 
And by the end of 2005, I'd made a million dollars. I'm like, holy shit, I made a million dollars. I got a fucking million dollars. Right. And, uh, and then it just kept going. Okay. And it kept going and it snowballed. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, what were some of the first things you bought uh, with that million dollars? Let's see. I moved, to, I moved to California from Toronto in 2006. And, uh, and then I bought, so I bought a house. Okay. I bought a million dollar house. And I was like, yo, I got a fucking million dollar house. It was in the Hollywood Hills. Mm-hmm. Um, it was on a street. You know the Hollywood Hills houses, how they have the worst streets ever? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and because I never lived here and I didn't know anybody here, I, it didn't matter. Like, you know, my manager from here was like, you know, is it really bad for parking? If people come visit, he goes, I don't fucking know anybody here. Nobody's visiting me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it works out. Yeah, so I bought this really nice house. I bought it off a porn star. <laughs> Which porn star? Uh, she was like a... Like an Andrew Blake kind of porn star. Oh, okay. You know? One of them high end. Not high end, but it was like more more fancy kind of yeah. porn, I guess. Fancy porn. I forgot her name. It was Angel something or okay. or another. Anyway, um and I, I when you walked up the stairs to go upstairs, there was these, you know, those kind of thin windows, like a series of them. Yeah. And when you stopped on the stairs, you could see the Hollywood sign from there. And I remember just going, Holy shit, look at, like I I was it was a complete dream scene for me because I would have dreams while I was sleeping in that house that in my dream I woke up and I was at my house in Toronto. Mm. I was like, oh, it's just a dream. <laughs> or I would go home to Toronto to visit and I would go back to my, the townhouse that my brother and I lived in because he was still living in it. And I would go back to my bedroom. My bedroom was exactly the way I left it. You know, no, it's just a bed on a frame, you know, a headboard, a bunch of clothes on the floor, my DVD player beside the bed, little portable DVD so I could watch shit. I didn't have a TV on the wall. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I would wake up there and I'd go, oh, maybe this California shit was a dream. And I'm like, no, no, it's real. It's real. Right. Because, you know, after doing the, you know, selling out the, the Air Canada Center in 2007 and 2008, you actually hosted the Juno Awards. Yeah. And for cool. those that don't know, that's like the Grammys in Canadian Canada. Canadian Grammys, yeah. Right, which is a big deal. Yeah, it was a big deal. And you're hosting it. I'm hosting it. Okay. And then you hosted it the next year also? I think so, yeah. I hosted it two years in a row. So things just started to completely take off. Complete different trajectory in my life. Okay. Uh, and, and it still hadn't occurred to me what was happening. Like, I still wasn't like, yeah, I've arrived. I was like, I was still literally going, what the fuck is going on? This is amazing, but I love what's happening. Right, because then uh, in 2009, uh, you sold out London's O2 Arena. 16,000 yeah. tickets. Yeah, two nights. Two nights. So now you're not just selling out your hometown, you're going overseas and right. doing it. Yeah. And I had sold out MSG two nights in 2008. Madison Square Garden. Yeah. I did the theater though. And then we found out later I should have done the full garden because yeah. two theaters is one garden. Oh. Okay. And that's actually where I shot my uh, special, uh, uh, Red, White, and Brown in 2008. Okay. So at one point, uh, I guess between 2009 and 2010, you started making the Forbes list. Yeah. Okay. I guess uh, you're making 15 million a year at that point. Yeah, it's crazy. But listen, here's the thing. And people hear that number, they go, wow, you must have a lot of fuck. No, here's what you find out once you hear people making that kind of money. Let's just go with an even number, like 10 million, all right? Okay. Say you see the person made $10 million. That's what they grossed. Right. So take your 10 and cut it in half. Now you got five. That's the taxes. Right. Okay. Now you're down to 5 million, right? Mm hmm. Still seems like a good number. Yeah. But your agent takes 10%. Well, off the top. Wait, wait. Yeah, your agent takes 10%. Your manager takes 10%. Your accountant takes uh, 2% or something like that, or 2.5%. So, but they don't take it from the five, they take it from your 10. Right. So there's um, a million, another million, uh, say half a million. So you're now down to $2.5 million. Well, no. out of 10, you've got 2.5. Well, no, no, no. You start with the 10. Right. You take two and a half off the top to pay the, the the managers and all that, right? Right. So you're left with seven and a half. Right. You cut that in half. Right. You're left with about almost four. Am I doing it wrong? I think you are, yeah. Oh, well, you're... They, they take it off the top. You don't pay taxes and then pay them. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they, they take it before taxes. Oh, okay, well, that's good. So you're, you're only left with four million. Yeah. Boo-hoo. So, well, I know, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you get 40% of what you think you've made. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. 60% is not yours. No, it's not. That's a shitty, that's still a shitty fucking deal. That's why people move overseas and move to. Yeah, and then I, you know, in 2007, I moved to Las Vegas. 
Right. That's that's how people kind of protect yeah. their money. And I was like, yo, I'm, I'm staying here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when the money first started coming in, and, you know, I've gone through this myself, and I talk to a lot of people who I interview. Suddenly, all these relatives start to pop up that you didn't know about. Oh, man. Your friends who you had a certain type of relationship with man. your whole life. Yep. The relationship starts to change. What started to change with the people that you knew? Um, it was a lot of the people around me like thought I was going to give them my money. <laughs> like the guys, I was like, "Oh man, we made it! Look at what we did!" I'm like, "We? What? We, motherfucker? <laughs> no, what? We? What are you talking about? Get out of here!" Then I would get people hitting me up that I haven't seen in decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, listen, my mom's really sick, and uh, you know. We were really nice to you when you were a kid, so don't forget that. Right. And I'm like, so what? <laughs> like, fuck you, dude. Like, and then we get mad. Like, yeah, you think you're so fucking great. I'm like, no, you. What the fuck kind of? When did you become entitled to my shit? Yeah, you haven't seen me in years, but you still have the nerve to like fucking hit me up for loot. Yeah, I lost a bunch of friends. When it happened. TV started to take off. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot. People would just. And then, and then they would try to justify it, like, oh, well, I seen you spend some money on some bullshit, and you're not going to help me out? Yeah, and you're and like, like, yeah. I, I had spent my money on bullshit I wanted. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I had a dude hit me up, a comic I knew, uh, a couple months ago. He hit me up with this long sob story about how he's not working, and if I could help him out with 3500 bucks. And at the time, I could not help him out. You know what I mean? Like, I just... I wasn't in a place where I was like, here, I can even just call my manager or my accountant and go, hey, can you get, like, no, I am like, no, you're not fucking doing that. And that's why you have those people. So they stop you from doing dumb shit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so he hit me up about this and long story and, and, uh, and I didn't reply to him right away because I was, you know, thinking about it. I saw the text and I'm like, I, I mean, I don't even know how to word, yo, I can't help you right now. I was just like, I don't know. Literally 24 hours later, he replies again to me. Oh, it's like that, huh? Oh, yeah, you, you forget the fucking people that you started with and that were so good to you. Remember, I was your first fucking friend in this business. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, well, fuck you, you fucking fraud. And, and then uh, you're, I'm going to mention you in my suicide note. I'm like, whoa. Wow. wow. I'm okay. like, I just blocked him after. I'm like, I don't know. What to, I didn't even reply to him. I'm like, oh, you didn't even give me 24 hours to fucking reply, dick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not even like, yo, did you see my text? Can you? Not even like a check. Did you see it? You know, not, you know. Yeah. Like. Uh... You don't know what's going on in my fucking life. You know what I mean? No, I mean, I just interviewed uh, Marcellus Wiley, who, uh, you know, he uh, has a show on Fox, on Fox Sports. Okay. Uh, he's an ex-football uh, player and does very well for himself now. We were just talking about why rich people have such small circles because the amount of people that just start to come at you between the bullshit lawsuits, mm -hmm. you know, the, the extortion attempts, mm -hmm. all that type of shit. You know, I, I remember Nick Cannon, who who's a regular on my show, was telling me about how his nanny sued him and Mariah because their one-year-old headbutted her. Your nanny sued you because your two-year-old headbutted them. Yeah! To me, that is the absolute perfect analogy of what happens when you have money. Yeah, it's like... Because if you were working at GM... Yeah! Your babysitter would not be suing you. So, like, I like, Sue me for baby. what? <laughs> like, like, but I'm, I got to go... Talk to lawyers and talk about, well, uh, I don't think he intentionally had bought the nanny. <laughs> We're going to put that baby on the stand. Yeah, yeah like. <laughs> wow. Like, you, you know, like, just dumb shit like that. So yeah. you just get so worried about just stupid ass people suing you, which which I've gone through myself, right. that you just stop fucking with people altogether. Yeah. And then all those people are like, oh, you've changed. You're different. Well, no, I'm just worried that you're going to try to do some dumb shit to And you. in L.A., you got a lot of scumbags that make their livelihood by suing you. Yes. Um, they start something with you, and then they sue you. Yeah. You get completely baited into it. Yeah. Like, it happened to me once. You got sued? Yeah, well, um, I was at the Laugh Factory, and these, I'm on stage, and uh, and uh, it's, I'm doing some doing my act, and then some, all of a sudden, I just hear, fuck Indian people. Okay. And I'm like, whoa. Whoa. Whoa, what the fuck is that? I, and I go, who said that? And this fucking douchey guy with long hair is like, I did. Fuck Indian people. And I go, and I said something back like, yeah, you don't fuck us. There's 1.3 billion. We fuck you. Right? And then everybody laughed. And he was like, him and he had like a bodyguard guy with him, like a diesel bald guy. And they were both glaring at me like this. And I'm like, 
And in my head, I'm like, I, I used to box. So in my head, I was like, really, motherfucker? And I do jujitsu. So I'm like, in my head, I was like, really, motherfucker? Like, you think because you're in a room full of people like you and I'm just the only one of me that I'm going to just be like, oh, my God, you got the wrong fucking guy. I, I never grew up like that. I never, like, I was bullied as a kid. That's why I started fighting. Because I was like, I need to learn how to protect myself. So mm -hmm. my instinct came in and like, oh, really, motherfucker? I put the mic down and I walked off stage. Then the club kicked those two out. Mm -hmm. Then they come over and they're like, hey, man, sorry about those two guys. They were causing problems the whole night. He was drunk. He even insulted the lady behind him and in front of him, blah, blah, blah. And then I go, all right. I was fuming, though. So I wait about 20 minutes. I'm like, 15, 20 minutes. I'm like, all right. I don't want to be here anymore. And that should be long enough for them to be gone. If you got kicked out, you got 15, 20 minutes, you should be gone. Mm -hmm. I go to leave the club, and as I'm walking down the aisle, the bodyguard guy is standing at the end of the aisle like this. Now, if I wasn't angry, I'd be like, it's a big dude. I'm not fucking with him. But angry, I'm like, as soon as I looked up, I was like, oh, I went pop right in his ribs. And he dipped down, and then I, I put him in a cross-collar chug. and went pop, pop, and I fucking choked the shit out of you. And he goes, it was the other guy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, get the fuck out of here. So I go outside, and then as I walk outside, the guy that was talking all the shit, he's sitting at the door. And as I walk outside, he leans in and goes, no hard feelings, huh? Motherfucker. Clack. And I didn't like the way I hit him, so I hit him with a left hook. Right away, pop. And then his teeth went right through my knuckle. Mm. And then, uh, yeah. But he does that. And then I found out after that that guy goes around, starts trouble to try to get assaulted so he can sue you. So he sued you? He sued me. And you settled? I settled. My lawyer was like, listen, you could take it to court mm -hmm. and you could win it, but you're going to spend way more money by hiring me, mm -hmm. by going to court, by canceling dates. He goes, just give this guy, we'll give him a shitty amount and he'll, he'll probably take it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like people think that when you settle with someone, that means you're admitting guilt. Yeah, no. What it means 99% of the time is that I don't want to spend the 300000 to go to court and win. And I can't recoup anything from you because you're broke. Yeah. So I might as well throw you this little small four or five digit amount. Yeah. Because it's going to be cheaper than actually going through the process of yeah. beating you in court. Yeah. Yeah, man. It sucks. He's a scumbag, you know? That's, yeah. And it was funny enough, years later, I was at some uh, movie premiere. And this guy walks up to me and goes, hey, man, uh, I don't know if you remember me. And I looked at him. Was that? <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I don't know if you remember me. I go, yeah, I remember you. He goes, hey, I just want to say it was a complete accident that night. I wasn't, I was that guy, and and uh, I'm a martial artist myself. I'm like, no, you're not, dude. Don't <laughs> fucking tell me that shit. I hit you in the ribs and put you in a choke. It's, you're a martial artist. Martial art me. <laughs> not too much martial. <laughs> Marshalling going on. You're more around. Marshall Mathers. <laughs> and even Eminem would have fought back. <laughs> I know, right? Well, you started getting a lot of shows, and at one point, you did a show for a Saudi prince. Well, it was, well, it was, so a prince had brought me to Saudi to do shows. Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Okay, where you can't drink. You can't drink. Can't smoke. Can't smoke. Oh, you can smoke. You can't smoke weed. Can't smoke weed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, these are, they're all very punishable by death, so you don't, mm -hmm. you, you go to somebody else's countries, you respect whatever their fucking laws are. Right. It, don't, don't be a dick thinking, oh, I'm this, I can do, no, 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 you're there. You're in their place, you do what the fuck their rules are. Oh, yeah. You abide by that shit. Now, I, I remember um, as a DJ, I used to do shows in Bahrain mm -hmm. where there was like big U.S. military bases. Yeah. And you could drink there. Yeah. So the Saudis would come over to Bahrain. Yes, because it's right next door. Right next door, get drunk, walk through like glass doors and oh, yeah, <laughs> just yeah, do yeah. stupid shit because they're not used to drinking. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, get arrested and get beat up by the cops or yeah. whatever else. Then go back to Saudi Arabia get, yeah. on Monday. And, yeah. You know, go back to their lives. Um, like, what was the most you ever got for one show? Um, I would say maybe seven hundred fifty thousand. Damn. Yeah, it's pretty good. That was uh, for a guy holding a fucking microphone I, talking shit for about an hour and a half or so. Yeah, yeah. If that. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was good. And that was uh, that was just a gig, like a regular concert gig. Okay. So I remember I had George Wallace on my show, and he was saying how. Yeah, these clubs are cool and all, but the corporate money is really where it's at. He's like, I'll do like a $300,000 corporate act and then go do a club for free that night. <laughs> you know, aside from all the Vegas gigs and all the touring, you would get corporate events that would pay like 100000 for a night. That's you where know, the you, real money is. People don't know where people are. Uh, that's the corporate money. When you can work with General Motors and McDonald's and, and the drug companies, 
you can go in there and be out of there with a buck a night and, and on your way, you know. But I love that. Yeah, I mean, George is, um, George, first of all, is a legendary guy. Yeah. And he's fucking hilarious. Oh, yeah. And he's, he's road, you know, he's, he's, he's tried, tested, and true, you know. And uh, he could play anywhere and, do, and, and kill. Yeah, he's actually a guy who I might take on the road with me. Well, I have promised him that I will, so we will go on the road together at some point. But I know putting him on in front of me is uh, dangerous because he's a killer. Oh yeah, oh yeah, he's a killer. Do you ever have? I know, like certain comedians, when they have people opening for him, they'll say, "Okay, well, don't talk about this." No, I never talk- do that. No. I never do that. I try to uh, put comics that are going to bury me on in front of me. And you look at some of the guys who I've. Uh, worked with in the past, they're all big name guys now. Guys that have opened for me, guys that I've put on TV on shows that I was hosting or whatever. Um, they're all big names. Sebastian, Joe Coy, Tom Segura, uh, Sam Tripoli, Burt Kreischer. Um, these are all guys that have, have been on the road with me and done things. Yeah. And now they're all they're all the A-list guys. Well, you were the first comic to do a Netflix comedy special. Correct. Which now is like the most sought at, sought after it, it thing. Is. But you were the first one they picked. Why, why you? Um, I think they had um, acquired some of my old, older specials. Okay. Like Green Card Tour and Red, White, and Brown. Maybe outsourced. I don't know. And uh, and I think they liked the numbers they were seeing on the, on the, on the viewing for it. So they came to me and they were like, hey. We want to do a special with you. I'm like, okay, cool. Because at the time, I wasn't thinking, you know, Netflix wasn't what it what it is now. Yeah. In 2012, when they came to me, mm-hmm. 2011, 2012, yeah. and I was like, uh, they were like, um, yeah, we want to do a special with you. I go, okay, and you know, this this is a conversation that you don't. It, it's so new. You're like, and they're like, what do you? I'll do a special. What do you mean? And they were like, what's the money like? I was like talking to my brother. What's the money going to be like? <laughs> and they go, well. And I go, uh, and then, so we do the special with them, but we can still, like, sell it on DVD after, right? Because <laughs> I'm still thinking <laughs> fucking DVD. And, uh, and he's like, no, 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 they're going to own it. Yeah. I go, what does that mean, though? Like, when can I sell it on DVD? Never. So they're going to own it for, like, two years, and then I can put a DVD out? And I go, no, no, they own it. You cannot put a DVD out. Yeah. I go, what the fuck, am I, I going to make money? Like, if they, buy, if they buy it one time, then they own it. What, where do I get my money from? He goes, oh, they're going to give you the money up front, but that's it. And I go, but how do I make money from it after that? I couldn't understand and there and then he was like and i was like i don't know like nobody's doing this yet i go he goes you'll be the first and i go well if i'm gonna be the first i might as well do it then right and uh so we did it and and uh we added the uh russell peters versus the world with it was which like the behind the scenes mm-hmm. kind of leading up to the special and then we did the special and uh it was a great partnership and it started something that is what it is now. Again, I love being the first. You know, I was the first comic to do the Air Canada Center. I was the first Indian comic in general. And mm-hmm. then uh, I was the first guy to do the Netflix special. I was the first guy to play the first comic to play the the O2 Arena and stuff like that. So I was the first comic to do the Barclays Center in New York. Mm. Well, was that the biggest payday you got for a comedy special from I, Netflix? I think so at that time. Yeah. It was over, over a million bucks, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The what first was one like? was more money than the second one. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And that's why I was like, wait, what's going on? How did it feel to get a million bucks to just do a, a It was more special? than a million. It was good, what, like 1.5? It was One, like two, I think. Two? Okay. Two and change. What did it feel to get two and change? That was amazing. I was like, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> did you buy anything off of that? Like, um, I think I bought another house. I moved or something. Okay. Time. Yeah, I, I, the special came out, and then uh, a year later, I, I moved. Okay. Because these days, like, how much did... um. Uh, Dave Chappelle get he got twenty million a special, and he did how many specials? He got a three special deal, and I think he's done three. He might, and he'll probably re up for another twenty or thirty million. I mean, it's but and so I think that's what um, I think it's kind of what upset me when uh, I did Almost Famous and I got less money than the first special. Mm-hmm. But then literally a week later they announced that they gave Dave twenty and Chris twenty and Seinfeld this and this and I'm like. Look, I'm not saying I'm at their level or I'm those guys, but I wouldn't have minded a little bit of like, a little something here's extra. a little, listen, we're giving these guys this much. You are the guy that started this. You opened this up for us. Um, we'll give you here, whatever. You, you know what I mean? Like, I would have been happy if you'd throw me five million. You know what I mean? I'm like, cool. But 
but whatever, it was what it was, and then I, you know, I was like, all right, well, the third special I do with them, we'll, we'll, we'll re-up then, we'll try and adjust the books, and then uh, the third special never happened with them. Okay. Well, did you get to know Reed Hastings at all, the, the CEO? Who? Reed Hastings, CEO of Netflix? No, I knew Ted. Ted. Ted Sarandos. Oh, okay. So Reed Hastings, you guys never crossed paths. I mean, I might have met him, but Ted yeah. was the guy I had my relationship okay. with, and you know that's how this business works. And it's you'll you quickly find out in this game that it's business, and none of these people are really your friends. Right. I guess there's a story how uh, Harvey Weinstein, you met him and he kind of fronted on you. Oh, he was a dick, dude. As a matter of fact, Ted Serrano's had introduced me to Harvey Weinstein at this event in New York, and Kevin uh, Spacey was there performing. <laughs> It was a night of wow, fucking weirdos. When you look back, you go, wow, all oh, weirdos in that room. It was like, it was like the, me too, ground zero. Oh yeah, much. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Who I, were you there? Yeah, me too. I was, that's, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, Ted takes me over to Harvey Weinstein. He goes, have you ever met Harvey Weinstein? I go, wow, no, I knew his name. I go, wow, Harvey Weinstein, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I'm like Harvey fucking Weinstein. Yeah, I know who he is. I don't know what he looks like. And he introduced me to him. And he goes, hey, Harvey, this is uh, Russell Peters. He's uh, starting off our stand-up division for us. He's our first special. And he does this. He goes, and then I go, okay. And he goes, uh, and uh, he goes, you comedian? I go, yeah. He goes, and then his wife goes, Harvey, he's really funny. I've seen him before. And he goes, that's what he did. And I go, in my head, I was like, you fucking fat cunt. <laughs> and then what happened to him? Look at him now. He's in prison right now. Yeah. Kevin Spacey was a dick. Look at him now. Yeah. You look at the people that front on you and act like dicks and they're famous, and you go, mm. eventually it's going to come back to you, kid. What did you think about the whole Monique situation with Netflix? Um, I mean, I understood what she was getting at, and I understood her, um, her disappointment with them. Mm -hmm. And I think she was hoping for... You know, again, but it's a negotiation. You know, people come in low on negotiations. Yeah. You know, it. I mean, maybe they're just lowballing her to see where she wanted to be. Right. And uh, so, I mean, I and, and and at the end of the day, I don't have anything personal against Netflix now. It's like, you know, listen, uh, I'll go back. They call, if they call me like, you want to do it? Yeah, fuck, let's go back. You know what I mean? I'm like, it's business. I get it. Yeah, I mean, she's actually suing them yeah, that's for bit... trying to not give her a high enough offer. Yeah, I mean that seems a little uh, uh, a little more than you're doing too much at that point. Right. You're Teddy Rileying this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're doing too much. <laughs> well, I had a situation with Monique. Did you? Yeah. You had her on this, didn't you? Yes and no. Oh, okay. She walked out on you. Not exactly. Okay. I interviewed her and her husband. Mm -hmm. They were literally holding each other the entire time, like like the entire time. Okay. Like clutching each other like right. this. We start the interview, and you know I, I give them give them the release form. And they're like, "Oh, well, we just want to, you know, we just want to look this over. You know, well, it's not going to be a problem, no problem." And I'm like, "Usually, I, I just say, well, we can't do it, but I'm like, well, let's just do it. I, I trust them." Right. We do the interview. It was a really dope interview. It gets into a lot of really personal topics and everything else like that. Uh, I say, "Okay, cool. Can you send me the release form?" I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. The lawyer finally gets back to me and says, well, we, we're, we modified the release form where we own the footage and we're going to license it to you for a year. Wow. <laughs> wow. So I said, look. Did they have the footage? No, it's my footage. Yeah, I shot gonna, it. How are you going to get the footage if you don't have it? No, they're like, well, we need, you know, we want to, you know, Monique is really into being fair and, you know, being compensated properly. And, you know, we just feel we won't have any control. I didn't even we... check how much you paid me for this. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you son of a bitch. I'm out of here. But no, I've never had anyone pull this shit on me. And it came from her husband. Her, her so... husband is, 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 is a piece of shit. Straight up and down. It's, uh... I don't know whether she even knows about this. But... I've never in all my years. And so then my lawyer was like, well, just put it out. You know, it's, you filmed it. They sat in front of a camera, blah, blah, blah. I put it out. We put out one clip and then we, we get a cease and desist. Really? And my lawyer is like, well, due to the back and forth nature of the negotiation, she might have a case. So is it really worth it for you to, to yeah. fight this in court? So we ended up having to just trash the whole interview. But you have it. I have it. Yeah. 
I'd but, like to see that one day. <laughs> I'll show it to you. <laughs> but the fact That's so weird. The you know, fact but, that you try to and I'm like, do you own the Breakfast Club interview that you did? Do you own the Sway interview that you did? Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure you don't. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you're not trying to claim ownership of that. You're yeah. just doing this to me. And it never came out. And it was, you know, and I'm so passionate about what I do that I'm just still pissed off to this day that I have this dope ass interview that never came out because they, they're basically trying to pull some fuck shit with me. Wow. How long ago was that? About a year. Wow. About a year ago. That's shitty because she's actually a nice lady. I mean, I, you know, I, I've I think met it's her, her husband. Times. I think her husband. I mean, it is, could be. I think her husband has ruined her career, honestly, to be totally honest. It's possible. You know, you get people in your life that, uh, that 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 overthink things. Well, they oh, they take something simple and make it complicated. Or they really don't have anything to really add, and they're just trying to prove to you that they're an important part of the team when yeah. they're really just fucking up your shit. Oh yeah, that's yeah. how I look yeah. at it. That's fair. Yeah, their unfairness is fair. Their unfairness is fair. So, anyways, I have nothing against Monique, but her her husband is is trash. Wow. I'll yeah, just, that sucks. I'll just dude. put that out there. Yeah. That's that's yeah. shitty. That sucks. And really I don't bad. think they're going to beat Netflix in a lawsuit. No, they're dead. Listen, <laughs> listen. L learn, learn when you're beat. You know, right? You know, like when I realized, uh, oh, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> you know, just le learn, learn to learn to mark it up as you know what, fucked up that time. Yeah. Never be too fucking cool to be to admit when you're wrong. Exactly. I'll always admit when I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I remember um, I, I did one of John Witherspoon's last interviews. Yeah, you did. And um, He lived around the corner from here. Yeah, yeah, he still, yeah, I, I took him home, actually. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's a, that sucked. such a talent. So bad. Uh, but I remember when uh, I brought up that whole situation with him, he's like, man, you got to put asses in the seats. You know, she, she, she's no Dave Chappelle. I mean, yeah. she's cool, but she's not Dave Chappelle. Yeah. You can't compare yourself to Yeah, to I mean, that. I'm still doing arenas. Uh, you know, here we are 13 years later, I'm still doing arenas. Yeah. So, I mean, I asses mean, in the seats. Asses in seats. I mean, yeah. you got to do what you got to do. I mean, I'm not doing this for that. I'm doing this because I'm a fan of the show. I'm a fan of the channel. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I hit up Faison. I was like, yo, that was a really dope interview on yeah. Vlad TV. Because Faison is one of those guys who, he's also one of my dearest friends, and I love Faison to death. He's also one of those most underrated, intelligent human beings on the planet. I he's agree. Very sharp. Very much so. Very astute. And he he and if you try to play him for stupid, he will fuck your head up with not being stupid. Yeah, he's the one that actually set us up together. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. I remember we were doing a movie when we were doing the movie Ripped. Uh, when we were doing it about maybe four or five years ago. Five years ago, and uh, we were in uh, Austin, Texas, shooting it, and we're doing this scene uh, in the movie where Faison's googling something, and he's typing really fast, like fake typing. Tick, tick, tick. And the producer, and the director's a like, cut. Can, they, can you uh, type slower? He goes, why? He goes, because you guys just came back from 30 years ago. You'd never seen a computer before, and now you're typing really fast. Oh, yeah, I, I saw that movie. Yeah. 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 And he's like, what? He goes, what, I, a, a, a fucking black man can't type fast? He got really mad, right? <laughs> and, and then he, he got really pissed, and he stormed off the set, right? And I was like, oh, shit. He goes, fuck you. I make fucking movies. I make real fucking movies, not this fucking bullshit. <laughs> fuck you, motherfuckers. And he leaves the house, slams the door. And then everyone in the crew is looking at me like, you going to go talk to him? And I'm like, you want me to go talk to him? And uh, so I go outside. He's across the street in the parking lot. And I walk over to him. And it's like the end of the day. It was like it was a long day. It was really hot. I mean, you know, I had a right to be upset about it. And uh, so I'm standing there talking to him. I'm going like this. I'm going, and I go, hey, so you want to go eat after this or some shit? And he goes, what the fuck are you doing? I go, I'm making it look like I'm yelling at you. So I think I'm fucking screaming on you. And he goes, you're a fucking idiot. Let's go eat. <laughs> he does the meanest ice cube impression. Oh, yeah. I heard him do it. It was great. Oh, yeah. On my show. Yeah, I on heard it. Show. It was amazing. That came out of nowhere. Yeah. I've never heard anyone and do And he ice did some cube. other impressions that were dead ass on. Yeah. Uh, Chris Tucker. Yeah, he does some good ass impressions. He does some good ass impressions. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love Faison. I can't wait to get him back. Yeah, he's amazing. So I remember you did Sway, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that uh, Trevor Noah steals your so jokes. So let me explain that day for you, just so you know. That day that I did Sway, it was the same day I had done, I think, The Breakfast Club that same day. Okay. And I hadn't slept in like 24, 36 hours. 
I was deliriously tired. And I, when I'm tired, I get cranky. When I'm cranky, I get angry. <laughs> and that's what happens. So you were just angry that day and tired. I, I was just, yeah, I was, I, you know what? I was just, I was being, uh, I was being, uh, yeah, I was tired and cranky. I was just, just, I was like, fuck it. Okay. I was just trying to, I was just being fucking angry is what I was. But did you really think, do you really feel that Trevor Noah steals your jokes? Uh, listen, I, here's how I feel about it. I don't even want to mention it anymore. Okay. Because it always stirs up, stirs up a shit storm of, of things that it's just, I don't have the patience for. Okay. So whatever people are doing, they're doing, and, uh, and I can't be fucking bothered. I, here's, here's how it is for me. You have two paths in life when you're walking. You could choose the bad road or the good road. Now, the bad road may seem a little interesting sometimes. <laughs> but fuck it, I'm going down the good road. Okay. I, don't need, I don't need the drama. Well, one of the alleged jokes is, is about the, the Russian accent. Right. Now, this is something that I'm, you know, and I don't care who, who did it first or whatever else, but I'm actually interested in this whole Russian I'll accent tell you, thing. I'll tell you about the Russian joke with yeah. me, my, my story with it. I know exactly how I wrote it and why I wrote it. I was engaged to a girl who grew up in Georgia, mm -hmm. whose first language was Russian. Right, the, the, Georgia, Russia. Yeah, not Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, Georgia, Russia. Yeah, and uh, and uh, so she, we were laying in bed one night. And she was talking to her mom on the phone in Russian, and then she hung up. And I looked at her. Oh, didn't you look at it? And she goes, "What are you doing?" I go, "Speaking Russian." And she goes, "No, you sound like you're talking backwards." And I go, oh, "There it is." And that's how I came up with the joke. And then at the time, we did have these two Russian plumbers that were working on our house. And it was Vladimir and Ale Alexei. Mm -hmm. uh, as you may know, those are very common names. Yes, they are. Vlad and Alexei. Vlad and Alexei. There's lots of them in Russia. Yeah. And, uh, and they were working on the house. And then she had told me that my last name, mean, Peter in Russian, means, uh, we can't even say the fucking word anymore, but my last name in Russian apparently meant, means faggot. Yeah. Peter, right? I've never heard that before. Yeah, well, I, you know. I'll take your word for I, it. I'm, I'm hoping your parents aren't saying that to you. Okay. Um, and I was like, like, does it mean gay? She's like, no, no, it means faggot. I go, like, homosexual? She goes, no, no, no. Actually, it translates directly to. I go, then what's gay? She goes, gullo boy. I go, oh, okay. And then she goes, and Peter's faggot. And I go, wow, that's fucking crazy that you have a word like that in Russian. And then uh, the, the two plumbers were at the house, and I go, Hey, do you guys know this word, uh, bitter? And they go, <laughs> bitter. And then they were laughing. And then every time they'd see me, they go, ah, bitter. And then I was like, motherfucker, stop calling me that now. Uh, you do a pretty good Russian accent, I got to say. Well, I was around them. You were around them. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny as I, 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 whenever there's like Russian people in the audience, they, I get a lot of Russians showing up now because mm -hmm. of that joke. And uh, I, I subsequently had learned a lot of Russian words, so I always throw them in here and there. And or when they give me... Like Russian people give me a hard time when I'm on stage. I'm like, Let me make some Russian joke. Come on, bro. And I'm like, Zit Ganesha, the Yoka. And you do a lot of racial humor in general. I do. I've I, been known for that. Yeah. Um, and and I'll, I'll be honest. Like the first, the first time I met you, you kind of threw me off a little bit. Right. Uh, because Lord Jamar was DJing. Ah, uh, this was right? at uh, Santos. No, no, no. At uh, I forgot what club it was. Might have been Santos. No, no, no. It was the, it was the one in the meatpacking district. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Tony to Toka Tuesdays. Yeah, yeah. Tony Touch was, was in the booth with us. It was yeah. me, you, And Jamar. I would have been drunk as fuck at that night. You, you were pretty drunk. Yeah. Right. And then it was like, you know, Jamar introduced us. You're like, oh, shit, DJ Vlad. Rap phenomenon. Yeah. And then, you know, we started talking. Yeah. And then uh, you said, the blacks love you. Yeah. But then do you remember what you said next? No. Said, don't call him Abiziana. Yeah, yeah, that's probably what I said. Right, which literally means don't call him monkeys. Yes. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I just, I just didn't know how to take that. So because yeah, you, you, like, you didn't really know where my brain was. I, at. I didn't really know, and 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 I kind of felt some type of way. Did you about? It. I did. Really? I did. And it wasn't until a bunch of my friends, like Lord Jamar, Faze on Love, Michael Jai White, were like. And I told him that story. They're like, no, man, he's not. He was just cracking a joke. He's not. Yeah. This is not a racist guy. Yeah, you know what it was? It was, I, I was like, well, here's a word I know. <laughs> it was like, eh, well, let's do, the, and Drunk Ross was like, hey, just whatever. And then I, I've had a lot of people come to me and go, do you know what you said to so-and-so? I go, no, what? They go, I go, it was really fucked up. I go, next time I see them, I go, hey, man, sorry about that. I, uh, 
I didn't know you were going to take it the wrong way. It, it happens more often than not. Let me just say that. Yeah, yeah. It, it threw me off, and I kind of was like, uh, I, I don't know about this guy. And then, you know, but like I said, my friends were like, nah, like, this is a cool dude. Like, yeah. Now, like we've known him like way longer than you and you know yeah. like michael j white knew you from like way back in the day yeah, my, the toronto yeah. days like. it's funny michael j white so i meet michael j white in michael j white michael j i was calling yeah. him fucking the wrong name he gets so mad at me every time <laughs> michael j white um i meet i meet him at uh the comedy store one time in 2010 and he goes oh man let me take a picture with him i'm a big fan I, and i'm like what and he goes yeah big fan i go mike we, we've met before <laughs> We did? Where? I go, we didn't just meet. We hung out for two fucking days. What? When? I go in Toronto when you were promoting the Tyson movie. What? You were there? I only remember hanging around Drew and some other guy. I go, yeah, I was the other guy. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. So I jogged his memory. I was like, shit, I'm embarrassed about that. I go, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, because you do a lot of racial humor. I do. But... but You've actually had racism towards you. Like oh, you've I actually dealt... had people call you the N-word and stuff like that. Oh, I, I've dealt with a lot of racism, especially in the 70s and early 80s. It was bad. Especially in, in, a lot of people don't realize this, that in Canada in that time, they were getting the, um, they were taking their cues, the racist cues from Britain. And mm. there was a lot of Indian immigrants in England. A lot. And uh, they, were, they were dealing with a lot of racism there. And then that bled over to Canada and we were getting it. And I was, and you know, I was just a little kid, but I was getting it bad. And it was like bad. Like it was more than just being called names. It was being spit at and mm. kicked or punched for no reason. And I'm not like, I'm not talking like in my teenage years, I'm talking like in my four, five, six, seven years old, this is happening. And not just by kids my age, older people, adults, you know, spraying you with hoses and shit. And you're like, and that affects you, that fucks your head up. And then the way I found, uh, so I never hung around the white kids because they were, uh, I didn't trust them. I didn't know what was going to happen next. So I hung around the black kids from about the age of four. So all my friends were West Indian. They were either Trinidadian or Jamaican or Guyanese or Bayesian or whatever. And, uh, and so that was always my headspace. So from about the age of four, for, for about 46 years, <laughs> I, I've been, so mentally, I get told this a lot sometimes, you know, you're not black, right? I'm like, I know I'm not black, but... The, my brain processes that it processes like when something happens in the black community my brain immediately reacts to it because it's like that's us that's you that's i'm like oh it directly not anymore but my brain feels that i feel that more than i feel other things yeah because my memories are all that all my good memories are that i mean do you feel like in comedy you can go over the edge in terms of racial humor um I don't know if you can go over the edge. I mean, my goal is to make you laugh. Yeah. And my goal is to, if I'm talking about a culture or, or, or a race, my goal is to say things that only that culture and race will understand. While the other people are still laughing at it, it hits the person I'm talking to or about. Like when I did the Russian joke, it hit you because you're Russian and you knew that I actually threw some actual Russian words in there. Mm-hmm. So that's the goal. And when I make, you know, when I do my Chinese impression, the Chinese people go, hey, we love your Hong Kong accent. And I'm like, they know the accent. Like they can pinpoint it. Mm -hmm. They know exactly which one I'm doing. And then I throw in some, some words in Cantonese. And, I, you know, you want to make people know that, yeah, I'm, I'm making a joke, but I've, done, I've taken the time to know about you so that I'm not doing just this blind fucking blah, you do this, blah, isn't that funny? And I'm like, no, I understand things about you. Well, the Indian community has some sometimes kind of pushed back. Sometimes. Yeah, like I remember there was one uh, review where it said, uh, you know, Russell Peter set was uh, full of displays of quote unquote Indian humor that would make his contemporary brown comedians sink in shame because honestly at this point, Peters gives uh, brown funny folk a bad name. Wow, when was that? That's in my notes. Well, how long ago was that? Uh, I think this was January two thousand twenty. Wow. Well, that's that guy's fucking. You know, uh, let me see. There's a there's a, a link here. It's from, you see. Here's the thing with that from uh, meow dot com. Oh wow. Meow. Uh, Claws out. Kids. Deported. Another tired old Russell Peters comedy special with defunct racial stereotypes and homophobia. Wow. See, they, that's the thing nowadays. You can, 
you can anybody can put a review out. Yep. And they can take anything you say and make yep. it seem the other way. That's why I was hesitant to talk about uh, my lap either because I'm like somebody's just going to hear me say that word and they're like, oh, yeah. see, see, he said it and he says it. And I'm like, no, I'm just explaining it. But yeah. again, you got these people, they're like, ti- like you can't say they're tired uh, racial stereotypes. I did it in fucking India. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You can't say I'm talking about Indian people the wrong way when I'm doing it in India in front of Indian people. Like when you go to India and you do your Indian jokes, what right. happens? They connect. Yeah. They know, like, listen, it doesn't matter how you feel if you're an Indian person outside of India and you don't have that connection. Like you or or you you go out of your way to connect. Just be you. Understand this is your life and this is what you know. It's your reality, right? But that don't don't uh, negate what somebody else's reality is. I had some uh, some guy put something about a uh, uh, DM me about, hey bruh, maybe your generation talk like that, but our generation doesn't talk like that. So maybe you should stop doing the accent. And I'm like, first of all, don't call me fucking bruh, dick. You little fucking kid, right? You know what I mean? So, and if you would say it to my face that, that I'd respect you, but you don't. And because there's a solid chance you leave with no teeth. You know what I mean? But, but, but the thing is, like, yeah, I, that's how my dad spoke. And my friend's parents spoke. So you can't get mad at me for, and it's not like I'm just up there dirt, burk, burk, doing that for no reason. I'm doing characters when I'm doing it. Is it, it, it going to be funny if it's like, hey, so my dad said to me, uh, yeah, go, go to work. No. But if my dad said, it's on go to work. Like, it's, that's how I would have heard it. And my dad would never be like, yeah, so what's up? You know, like, it's, 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 un, it's unrealistic. Yeah. So when people are like tired, first of all, I'm the guy that started that. So yeah, if somebody else does it, it's fucking tired. But if I do it, that's what I do, you know. Well, uh, in 2018, mm-hmm. The Simpsons actually wrote off the Apu character. They sure did, based on the backlash. And yeah, I guess, the Harry Kondabolu. Uh, right. There's a, there's a documentary. Yeah, and I'm in it. Called the Problem with Apu that you are in it. I'm in it. Uh, I didn't get to see it. I'll be honest. Okay. Uh, but what was your take in that documentary? I mean. Uh, for me, when when he was asking me about it, I, at the time, growing up, we had no like representation. So to see anybody, I was like, fine, I'll take it. It's only over time and with political correctness and you know everybody being woke all of a sudden. I'm like, yeah, it gets tired after a while. But you do got to understand, at the time when it was done, it was fine. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't ideal, and 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 I get. The problem with Apu, you know what I mean? Like, what's the problem with Apu? Well, for me, uh, we had no, we were an invisible minority at that time. So the only person you saw of of an Indian heritage was this cartoon character mm-hmm. who was played by a white guy. You know, oh, a white guy plays him. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. Didn't know that. Hank Azaria played him. Okay, I didn't know. Yeah, they had to write him off because Hank Azaria said, "I don't want to do it no more." Oh, okay. Yeah, he was like, he felt it. You know what I mean? And, okay. Uh, well, but the, but it's fine. I mean, like it, you know, it is what it is. I mean, we had no representation. I used to look at Eric Estrada and think he was Indian. He, if you look at Eric Estrada, he looks Chips. Indian as fuck. Yeah, <laughs> but don't he look Indian as shit? He looks, he looks Indian, Indian as yeah. fuck. Okay. And I've met him. Like, holy shit, are you sure you're not Indian, bro? Because you look more Indian than me. <laughs> right. Well, because look. If you go into a bunch of 7-Elevens, even in LA, you will find a lot of Indian people. Engli- Indians or Bangladeshis or yeah. Pakistanis and you know. For 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 whatever reason, owning 7-Elevens seem to be like a business that's popular in the Indian community. Yeah. Right? They could own their own company, they could set their own hours and yeah. they could have I mean, a it, sense it, of ownership. Know, There's nothing shameful about owning a 7-Eleven. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh and And growing up it was like, you know, especially growing up around black guys, that's what you would get snapped on about the whole time. Like 14, 15 years old, that's when my black friends were like, yo, hey, uh, do me a favor. Yeah, when your dad comes home, can you ask him to bring me a Slurpee on his way home? I'm like, ah. Uh. And, <laughs> and then I go, you know, and I would do that, you know, because you, you're going back and forth with these guys. I'm like, well, it's funny you should mention my dad. Now, how's yours? Oh, yeah, you don't know him. You know, that kind of shit. It was like always, that's, you're just snapping on each other all the time. So it's fine. It's what it is, you know? You can't get mad at a stereotype if it's, if it's, if it's based off something real. Yeah. Yeah. You, like, why do people get mad at reality? No, I feel you. Like I, I went to a Seven Eleven the other day to pick up some crazy glue, and it was Indian people who were running it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's just, it, it's, it's not. I can imagine if it, this is something that was only okay. Look, look in in two thousand twenty, Indian people don't own Seven Elevens at all. Okay, cut it out. But that's just not the reality. It's not the reality, and we own yeah. Subways too. 
No one's up. Exactly. That's another Subway, popular business. Seven Elevens. I mean, I, I don't see any gas stations. Look, at the end of the day, you got to look at it the right way. Stop looking at it the negative way. Here's how you look at it. This immigrant person moved to America and figured out a way to not have to work for somebody. Facts. That to me is impressive. What, you own a 7-Eleven? That's fucking impressive because I don't. I shop at one. Right. So who's the fucking winner? In I'm this? giving you money right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, you're taking my money, which means you win. <laughs> right. You can't be mad at that. Now, you're a, you're a lifelong hip-hop fan. Lifelong. Uh, Faze on Love said, ask him who's the rapper that you would cry for. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I'm that not I quite sure for? what he meant. Well, who, what's the, I guess it means that what was the rap one rapper that you would meet that you would actually cry? I, I, I mean, if Biggie was alive, I'd probably cry. You'd cry for Biggie because I've I I've had it happen where I'll be I'll play um a Biggie song and while I'm rapping I get fucking teary eyed mm. like Biggie's verse in Victory. Mm, yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, like the the second verse that he does, not the first one. Like it's him and then it's puffy and then it goes back to him when it goes back to him it's like this fucking pop 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 and i'm like and i always get fucking emotional doing it mm -hmm. yeah. and uh on um uh last day that song last day that biggie did with locks yeah um that that verse he's the last verse in that song mm -hmm. when my son was born the first within the first 10 minutes of his life i put last day on and i played it for him nice and i skipped right to biggie's verse <laughs> Um, but you've, you know, you're from Toronto. Mm -hmm. Toronto has a very interesting hip hop history. I mean, you had Maestro Fresh West back yeah. in the day. Uh, you had Cardinal Official, mm -hmm. Socrates, Chaclair, Chaclair, but none of them came close to Drake. Right. It's not even close. Oh, it's, 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 it's not even in the same. Listen, uh, Drake, remote ball Dr Drake is, is like, but Drake is so big, much bigger than he's he's the king of hip hop right now, or rap, as you will. I would say Kendrick, but you can really? get to Drake. No, no, okay. sir. Let me put it like this. Let me say it like this. I'm talking on a commercial scale. Yes. You can go anywhere in the world, you're going to hear a Drake song. Okay. I, you, I'll agree with you're that. You're not going to hear a Kendrick song. Well, let me put it like this. If Drake, Eminem, Jay Z, and Kendrick Lamar all dropped an album on the same day, I think most people would listen to Kendrick's album first. Uh, I think you're wrong. Okay. Uh, you said Drake, Jay-Z, mm -hmm. Kendrick, and who? Eminem. Eminem. Jay-Z yeah. would win that. I don't think so. I think Jay-Z would get the first listen. Then it would be either M or Kendrick. I'd probably I'm say I'm not Kendrick. talking about people in our age range. I mean the whole population. No, all Drake, the hip hop Drake, Drake would definitely get the number one listen. I don't think so. I think so. I think people would would listen to Drake probably second, but I think first they would listen to to Kendrick's album. No, I look at the amount of award awards that Kendrick that, gets. That doesn't matter. It There's plenty does. of people with a lot of awards. Kind of does. I mean, kinda, uh, uh, you listen, don't just get Grammys for nothing. Listen, Not that many Grammys. Listen, Drake. I, th I think Drake's got more Grammys than him too. I don't think so. I, I think you should Google let's, that. Let's look it up. Look it up. Bum, 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 bum. He's got four. Rap song for God's Plan, rap song for Hotline Bling, uh, rap sung performance for Hotline Bling, kind of the same song, mm -hmm. two Grammys, and rap album for Take Care. Okay. Let's look up Kendrick Grammys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That's crazy. Twelve Grammys. Yeah, but three three times as many Grammys. Let me tell you something, and I know it's a very unpopular opinion. I I don't I and I'm a hip hop guy, and I appreciate Kendrick, but I no nah, not for me. Not for you. Not for me. That damn album really really did it for me. I like, think when I heard damn, I'm like fuck. This this album right here. You heard damn and you went fuck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly what I did. Uh, that album, I don't think that Drake has a project as strong as damn. Okay, but in the long run, Drake puts out more more material, way more material. Drake's listen. Drake's very smart. Yeah, Drake knows what he's doing. Look that two Z slide shit. Yeah. He, he, do you think he went to a choreographer to do that? No, he was literally standing there, <laughs> and then his friends were like, "Ha, ah, that's funny," and that's and and he wrote a little catchy thing to it. And now everybody's fucking doing it. Yes, yeah, billion streams on TikTok. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, it's crazy. So that's what I mean. It's like, but at, you can win all the awards you want. Yeah. But 
But at the end of the day, you go to a club, what are you going to hear? Well, I mean... And, 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 you know, and that's the same... Go I mean, and that's... Kendrick is more of the underground artist, but he's the more celebrated one. Yeah. Right? Um, but if, you know, I... Listen, I, I'm going to be very unpopular opinion, I'm about to say. Uh, Kendrick is good, but I think if Kendrick and Drake and any of these new guys were around during the golden era, 90 to 95, or 88 to 95, whatever the fucking golden era time, everybody has a different timeline for the golden era. Yeah. None of them would have existed. They would have been like, eh. They would have been like one of the other guys, but they wouldn't have been what the other guys were. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, obviously, this is a hypothetical. It's all hypothetical. Between... It's kind of like when you, uh, you when you make um, uh, those uh, hypothetical boxing matches. <laughs> you know, who would win, Sugar Ray Leonard or Floyd Mayweather? You're like, I don't know. I mean, Sugar Ray had was a bit tougher, and Sugar Ray was more likely to stand and trade with you, and Sugar Ray had more power in his punch. And then I'm like, but but Floyd was so slick, and I'm yeah. like, you know, but th again, it's theoretical. Yeah, I feel you. Well, and also I'm speaking from the point of a guy who's 50 years old who who goes, yeah, it doesn't. Nah. I mean, look. I mean, none of them are really speaking to me. They're not making music for us. They're making music for the kids, and that's who they're supposed to be making music for. Yeah. And if the kids um, get mad that we don't like their music, they're supposed to because our parents didn't like our music. And right. you can't boil it down to uh, you know it sucks. You just got to go. It's, it's not made for you. Well, right. And I mean, Jay-Z is the only 50-plus-year-old that's still making music that still reacts on and a nuts. massive level every yeah. time. Uh, you know, but I still got to say that I connected more with the Kendrick album. But I think that's I, I listened right. more to the Kendrick album than I did to, to Jay-Z's last album. I mean, I, I, first of all, I, I, none of them. Eminem is the only album I bought out of that group. Okay. Um, I like Eminem as well, but... Uh, see, I love... And, and M's... Not the last one, but the one that came out last year. Yeah, Kamikaze. Kamikaze. That's the one I liked. That album is fucking fire. Yeah. He, he dissed my man, Lord. Well, our man, Lord. Yeah, Jamar he, he did, Mr. <laughs> and I felt bad rhyming along with it, too. <laughs> you rhymed along to Lord Jamar. I'm rhyming along. You know, I'm like, oh, but I'm just following the flow, you know? But M really fucking murdered in that album. I texted Royce. I was like, yo, M fucking dis Like, this is an incredible album. I played that album a lot. And I haven't played an album in years. Yeah, his new album I didn't really like. But that last one was... Uh, yeah, was the new album I was a little... I was like, eh, I was like mm, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah, I mean, I get it. I get it. I get what you were doing. Just I wanted it more on the level of Kamikaze, you know, yeah. with the... With the you know, just keeping it hip hop. It felt like he kept it hip hop in that one. Yep. And the the next one was more of a a pop, diary album. Pop album. Kind a di of. No, not even. I felt like it was a diary album. You know. Yeah. Like it was like here's some shit that happened in my life. I'm like that's great, Marshall. But um, we needed that album in the beginning. We don't need that album now. You know, we talked about your various property purchases uh, along the way. Apparently, you have a seven million dollar house in Malibu. That you're trying to sell eight seven, eight million now. Yeah, you want to buy it? Uh, let me check my bank account. No, yeah, I can't on, afford sure. it. Uh, <laughs> how much property do you own? Uh, a few, maybe five or six. Is that your main investment? No, I just do dumb things. What do you mean? I just buy houses and then figure I'll sell them, and they don't sell them. And they I don't. Them so, so this house here, apparently, you were trying to sell it. You, no one was buying it because it's well, an yeah, eight, eight million dollars. It's an house. expensive house, you know. It's not like people are walking around. Oh, eight, let me give you eight million for that. Because a person that can afford eight million like that can also afford probably fifteen million, right? And then we'll probably go. Well, look at that fucking amazing one at fifteen. You know, it's uh, it's it's a uh, and the house is dope. There's no fucking doubt. It's dope. It's ill ass house. But it's fine. Yeah, it's an I've eight it million out. dollar house <laughs> overlooking the ocean in Malibu. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so, I've actually considered when their lease is up moving back in there because it's leased till two thousand twenty three. I guess is that what it says? Yeah, that's what I said in the article. Yeah. Okay, because you live in Hidden Hills most of the time. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, I go back and forth between Calabasas and Manhattan. Yeah, we got a spot in Manhattan yeah. also. Uh, I go between there and Vegas. Ah, uh, okay. Now, but even with owning all these homes. And, you know, my house in Calabasas is pretty nice. Yeah. But I felt so poor when I saw Drake's house. Oh, my God. I felt poor. Uh, Drake lives down the road from me in Hidden Hills. And, yeah. Uh, 
and that's not that's not the house we're talking about. No, we're not. We're talking about the Toronto, the Toronto house. house. That was in, that's insane. My God, um, I mean that's a major stunt on everybody. <laughs> like that house, I haven't seen it or been there, but I've seen the videos, and it's pretty incredible. Yeah. I, you know, I've known that kid since two thousand nine. Really? Yeah, I knew him before he had all this, and he was. I, let me tell you something. When I talked to him then, and I talk to him now, he's the same kid. Hmm. He's a, he's actually a really good, really good kid. Do you have any idea how big he was going to get back then? I had no idea. Because, like I said, you know, a little while ago, Canadians just never really get over the hump in hip hop. It's true. In a lot of things, we never really get over the hump. Hmm. Um, it's just I, I, there's some sort of weird. Uh, um, uh, uh, stigma attached to us for some reason. For I don't understand it. Huh? Hockey, you guys get over the hump. Yeah, but th- that's all we get credit for. You know <laughs> what I mean? I, like I'm very grateful to Drake and very grateful to Bieber and Weekend. All right, Bieber. Oh, we. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm forgetting and about Tory Lanez is from my hometown of Tory Lanez as well. Yeah, there's that, and I almost there's feel a, like Drake opened the floodgate. Oh, he definitely opened the floodgates. Yeah, yeah. I think Bieber opened the door, and then Drake opened the floodgates. Right, because Bieber started to pop before Drake. Yeah, Bieber but, started popping at 14. Right, but that was, this was what, maybe 2010? I remember I was I was, uh, I was was actually working at Loud, Loud Records. You worked at SRC. Loud? Yeah. I didn't yeah, know that. Vlad TV was in SRC for years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Steve Rifkin? Steve Rifkin. Yeah. Exactly. And I remember um, Scooter Braun, who used to always, who used to also work with Steve Rifkin. Wow. Was, I met Scooter at... Uh... Sal's birthday party, uh, Sal Weekend's manager. Okay, yeah. And he was very cool, Scooter. Yeah, like, cool dude. Weird guy. But I remember he brought me Bieber, and I'm like, eh, this guy can't really sing. He's like, I disagree with you. And, and he can play. <laughs> Yo, Bieber's actually way more talented than people give him credit for. Yeah. I think they get, they, people. Uh, the problem is people get mixed up in your personal life, and they forget, just focus on what the guy's doing. Right. You know what I mean? Well, so yeah, the whole, the whole... Bieber can play drums, guitar, piano. He's, he's not a bum. Definitely not. Yeah. De- de- definitely not. Um, but no, I remember. Weekends had the number one album on Billboard for the past four or five weeks now. Yeah, no, uh, Weekends been killing it. Not, I'm not really a fan though. I'll be honest. Weekend, I mean, nah, not, he's not made my some. Thing. So, uh, listen, I, I, I'm not, again not my thing. I, uh, I again, I'm not into the new music that kids are making because it's not for me. But I will say that Weekend is very talented, and he's made songs that I know the 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 uh, the uh, chorus to you know what I mean where I'm like all right it's, like if I learn the chorus to your song that means it's something about it sticking out no he's obviously talented but I think that he has more of a female fan base really than a male um, fan base and that's fine because he's an R B singer yeah it's nothing a female wrong with that based R hey who would you rather your fan base be you know what I mean? yeah I mean as a guy obviously <laughs> yeah. you know I mean Vlad TV is like ninety percent male like you know yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> Most of my my DMs are coming from men. Oh yeah, <laughs> not yeah. women. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and well, very rarely do you have a woman on here. This is true. This is true because when we do, it doesn't always react. Right. Because men want to listen to other men. It's just kind yeah. of the way it is. We're very insular. Yeah. 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 Although Lunel is a regular guest. Well, Lunel Lunel's dope though. Lunel crosses lines, crosses yeah, she, lines. She crosses. And, and we get a big reaction for both men and women. Yeah, with with someone like a Lunel. Yeah. you know, I, I I would love to have ten more Lunels. Yeah. on here. Well, I mean, you can get them. I have to look for them. Well, I had Monique, and that didn't work out. Well, you know, that's why I got a Lunel. <laughs> so, what's next for you? Because I mean, you've done a lot of movies, but none of them really went huge. It seems. Is that is that? Yeah, fair? I mean, I mean, well. You know, I, I, you know, I've not, I've not been the lead in a lot of big oh, movies. Yeah, I've been the lead in, you know, a couple of B movies and low budget cinema type shit. And... Right, because I saw that one, the the Phase on Love movie. Uh, yeah, that was a stoner what, what, film. Yeah, was that a Netflix? No, that was just like a regular, okay, but low it, budget Netflix, independent film. Netflix I think Netflix it up, bought it eventually. Yeah, I think the first time we tried to pitch it to them, they didn't take it, <laughs> which right. is kind of funny, you know. Okay, um, um I mean. Are you going to stick with the movies? Or? I mean, you know, listen, it's not up to me. Mm-hmm. It's up to the people that make movies. Yeah. Do you want me in your movie or not? You know, I get I get sent out on auditions, and uh, and the report they usually get back is, it wasn't very good in the audition. I go, yeah, because you want me to fucking nail the scene in one shot. When you shoot the fucking movie, 
You take 15 shots of that one scene until you get it. Yeah. Why are you trying to make me do it when I don't really know it and I'm not personally attached to it yet? Mm -hmm. So I really don't like the audition process. So, you know, if you want me in your project, I'll do it. But if you're going to make me fucking... Like, look, there's there's actors that are just actors that really know how to nail that world. And, and I'm like, the, I like acting. I always wanted to get into acting. And I've got something to give. But uh, if I'm in the process of working on my new act, my brain won't go, let's really give this audition your all. It's like, hey, you got other shit going on right now. And that's what happened is I was working on my new act. And I'm like, oh, for this audition. I'm like, they're like, what did they think? You weren't very well prepared. I go, I was. What happens for me is, I'll get to the audition. I'll be reading it the whole way. I'm like, I got this. I got this. I walk in the room and the energy goes flat or whatever the fucking deal is. Mm. The words leave my brain. And then I'm like, uh, um, uh, uh, doing it like this, you know, and I, uh, I'm not a good auditioner. What can you say? Yeah. Give me the role and I'll do, I'll do my thing. But, and listen, if you're really hooked on the audition process and that's good for you, <laughs> but I'm not, you know, uh, it's not going to make me a gang of money. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't. I don't foresee me becoming a huge movie star in the, right. in the near future. Because ninety nine percent of your money came from comedy. Yeah, yeah. Now we're right in the middle of the whole coronavirus thing, mm -hmm. uh, and I feel you're too close. Yeah, let me back up. <laughs> uh, I mean, everyone I know, like for example, like I interviewed Boosie yesterday, mm -hmm. and he just told me he lost a hellacious amount of money. Oh All yeah, these shows that were booked. Yeah, his festival, Boosie Bash. All that. It's all bad. We're not going to say, uh, you know, he told me to cut out the amount he actually lost. You know, he said it in the interviews, like, you just cut it out so people don't show up on my door for a handout. But basically, he lost a massive amount of money. Yeah. You see, and all these artists who have have all these tours set up and all these shows and everything else like that, they're saying there's not going to be live shows till well into next year. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. That's what they're saying. How well, bad? they're not going to allow large, allow large gatherings. Large gatherings. So for me, I think I still might be able to survive playing the comedy clubs. Okay. Because I'm sure there'll be a cap on how many people they'll let into a place. And they got to spread them out, I guess. I don't know how it's going to work, but yeah. we're going to find out. Yeah. But I know it sucks because the uncertainty of it all is frightening. Right. I assume you lost a massive amount of money, all your bookings. A very, and a very, so. very decent amount of money is yeah, not coming in. Right, but you've been doing this for thirty years. Thirty-one years. Yeah, you you have money that you put aside. You have assets. You, you do have, and you don't. No, like you do, but if it's bleeding, yeah. I mean, you have a certain amount, but you also have a certain amount of blood in your body. You know, <laughs> unless somebody's pumping blood in while you're bleeding. It doesn't matter, but if there's nothing coming in, it's all going out. Right. I mean, if you're you just know, bleeding with no pumping. Then yeah, it's 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 bad. It's gonna get real bad. Uh, I'm gonna get a hush real bad. There you go, motherfuckers. I said it. <laughs> uh, I mean, do you see a lot of your contemporaries getting really fucked up over this? I, listen, I've been talking to a lot of comics. Yeah. And I thought we all thought. Matter of fact, we all call each other. I talked to Rogan. I talked to Joey Diaz. I've talked to. Uh, uh, a bunch of other comics, and I was like, like, how productive are you being? Like, none, nothing. I got fucking nothing. We all thought we would be like sitting down and, all right, it's a good time to work out our shit. And like, none of us. We've been so unmotivated because we don't, we write about what's happening and we don't know what the fuck is happening. Yeah. I, I, I remember um, I was watching, uh, I think like Dame Dash has this like video thing, and me and Dame. Don't have the best relationship. Wait, but. I don't know anybody that has a good relationship with Dame. <laughs> exactly. Me included. Uh, and I remember he showed, he was like, oh, the Dame Dash comedy. And he showed this one comedian doing a stand-up routine in an empty room. And I'm like, yo, and this is no shot of Dame. I'm like, just the, conceptually, this is so lame. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I've been asked to do some of those. And I go, I'm yeah. not doing that. Yeah. I'm going to stand in my fucking house and tell my jokes to who? I need to hear the laughter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ari Spears was just here. Aries, he Aries is my me, man. Aries, yeah. Aries, Aries goes in. That's he does. what I love about Aries. But, but he's telling me how like the, the owner of the Laugh Factory, you know, was trying to convince him to come in and do, like do like a Yeah, they're doing it there at like yeah. two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, something. like a do a, a routine with nobody there. And he's just like, Man, I don't want to do this shit. I don't want to do it either. Yeah. Is it do you really just need that audience? You need it. You need it's an energy. You need the energy to come back to you. Yeah. You know, we're not singing songs where you know, we're letting out these emotions that way. We're we're fucking we need 
We feed off of the. You can't play handball without a wall. You know what I mean? We need the <laughs> fucking wall. Hit the ball. Just yeah, keeps going. Fuck it, go. You know. <laughs> I need more balls. Yeah. 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 Well. Russell Peters, man, appreciate you coming in. A uh, long time fan. Um, you know, hope- for a first time misunderstander, long time fan. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I felt it was important for us to talk about that. Yeah, I know it's good because, because you know what? I you know 100. what? It's funny when you say it now. I remember the look on your face and I go, well, this guy doesn't get a joke in my head. That's a <laughs> like, well, this guy doesn't get fucking jokes, does he? Ugh. <laughs> Worst Russian ever. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, you get over shit. Yeah. You get over shit and you also talk shit out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and, and I purposely waited to tell you that until we were in the middle of our conversation because I figured if I told you that when we first talked, yeah, it, it's just going to set off a bad tone. Yeah, no, it's good because uh, the worst thing that I find in life is when you get misunderstood. Yeah. And that's the worst feeling in the world. You're like, wait, that's not... And there's plenty of times that that happens and has happened to me. Mm-hmm. And, what I, and, and what I do is I like to say something to people who I know something about that only they will understand and connect to to let them know hey i know and yeah. uh, a lot of times it backfires with like i was offended by that and you're not the first one it's happened many times where it was like um they said that in that meeting that yeah you were very offensive i go what what the fuck is offensive and then i play it back in my head i go right i addressed the gay guy and said you're gay you know what i'm talking about and i'm like but you're obviously gay. i'm not i'm not saying it to uh to diminish you or, or to, uh, to, to marginalize. I'm just saying it as like, look, as a, I recognize you have a beard. I recognize you have long hair. I recognize you, whatever. And that's just me letting you know that I'm aware of the room. Yeah. And, and, and people I, don't want you to be that aware. Yeah. No, no. Cause I remember when, when we were in a group chat, me, you and Faison mm-hmm. and you were like, Oh, Faison, my chorney. Yeah. Which, which means my black. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, Oh, okay. He he's actually doing it with black people as well. Oh, and everything I do. Else yeah, like I that. won't like do. He, I do it. Yeah. Listen, if I do a joke about somebody, people are like I'll be in, doing a show and I'm like, hey, talk about Asians, and I'm like, there's none here. Like, if there's no, if you're not there, I'm not going to talk about you. Okay. I need you there <laughs> to to confirm what I'm doing. Yeah. To let so you can let them know he's right. He's right. You know. That's all. I. I Otherwise, you're talking about people behind their backs, and I don't want to do that. Well, listen, it's all good. Because you, know, you told me Michael J. White had something. He there. said, you guys need to talk about his DJ skills. Oh. He's sick. We used to hang out in Toronto before he was doing comedy. He was looking for me for years in L.A., and I was a big fan before we connected. Yeah, so I, I, what I do is I make mixtapes for myself. Mm-hmm. Every couple of months. I, over this... Over this break, I've made two already. Mm. <laughs> and uh, But I make them, and then I don't make them with the intention of like ever releasing them or selling them. I make them with songs that I feel like putting on a mixtape. And it could be any range of emotions for me. So, you know, <clears throat> a friend of mine and his girlfriend, um, she left him for a couple of days during the, <laughs> during the lockdown here. And if you're my friend, I'm going to make fun of you. So to... Uh, help him get over it and mock him at the same time I made him a mixtape called Bye Felicia <laughs> <laughs> and it starts off it's like all songs that have to do with somebody leaving you or a bad relationship and it's and so it's like it starts off with the Alan Parsons project uh, I wouldn't want to be like you and then broken wings and then take the money and run <laughs> 50 ways to leave your lover it's that kind of shit on the mix you know what I mean so, so you just fuck it with them yeah but it, it actually turns out to be a really dope mix I and mean, I play it all the time now because I'm like it's a really good songs mm. and it ends with if this is it by Huey Lewis in the news <laughs> so yes I love hip hop but I love DJing and if you're a real DJ you love music yeah I mean, that's how I started yep. I started with DJing it's DJ Vlad that's why I always kept the name yep were you a cut guy you weren't a cut guy though were you no I, I, was, I was more of a blend guy yeah. I was known for the blends, yeah. rap phenomenon. Yeah, and Dirty Harry, what does he do? Is he a DJ too? Yeah, he's a, he's a blend guy as well. Okay. A little, little different than the I did I notice did. there was no cutting on that mix. No, well, and then when but we... But it was um, studioed as well, so... It was all studio, but then when we did Rap Phenomenon 2 with Green Lantern, who was Eminem's DJ at the time, right. he's, a, he's a cut guy. He's not really. More so than we are. Yeah, because I was like... Mm. More so than us. But then... But, but Green then, Lantern was also one of those guys to really use... Uh, multi-tracking yeah early like in the early 2000s exactly. i remember his mixtapes were bomb but then i did rock phenomenon which was a rock mashup tape and I, I had it, that i t- did it with oh, rock did with rock raider 
Ah, uh, yes, you did. Now he's yes. the cut guy. And now, now yes, he's really now, the Rock cut Raider guy. is definitely a cut guy. Yeah, rest in peace, man. Yeah, yeah. That, that I was remember a uh, tragedy hosting uh, the the one of the DMCs in Toronto back in the day, and Rock Raider and Talib were the guest judges. Mm. And uh, I had just met Rock Raider. And I was obviously a fan. And I went, so Rock Raider, I go, Rock Raider, let's check with Rock Raider and see what he thought of that routine. What do you think? And you know how his voice was, right? I was like, yeah, I thought it was pretty good, man, you know? <laughs> and I was like, and he started talking to him, yo, that's your real voice? <laughs> and he, he just looked like, and I was like, no wonder you're a DJ, not a rapper. He, got very, he was cool with it after, but I was like, at first, he was like, what the fuck, who are you? <laughs> Russell Peters, man, appreciate you coming in. Uh, DJ Vlad. <laughs> exactly. Congrats on all your success, man. Uh, you know, one of the only uh, comedians to get to a, a financial level. Uh, I actually did a internet search on you. They're mm -hmm. saying you're worth fifty five million. I saw that. I wish. I really wish I was. You really wish you were. Fuck. I wish I was, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be anywhere in the in the eight digit category is yeah, something I, that very few humans. I know, but get to I, I still wish I was. You still wish you were fifty five <laughs> yeah, million. I mean, listen. I wish I was at, at any double digit million. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> I'm sure you're there. When you cut all your assets and everything else like that. Pretty I suppose, sure you're there. Maybe, maybe. I'm pretty sure you're there. You you don't see three hundred thousand dollar homes in uh in hills. I wish you did. I know, right? <laughs> I'd buy five. Until next time, Russell. Peace. Thank you, Vlad. Yes. Спасибо, пожалуйста. Спасибо, сука.